I'd like the college and complexes to come to order, please. I would like to welcome everybody to the college and complexes. Order. Remember, this isn't the British Parliament. We're not debating Brexit. But I can do order. 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 Right. a good boy. <laughs> We will have, we will uh, the process of it engaging in excessive verbiation during the speaker is best uh, not to disturb other members of parliament. Oh. Now, now that we've had our little laugh tonight, uh, I would like to remember that this is a restaurant. You know, it's, it, it is it, it is suggested that you do buy something when you come in here to the restaurant, and not just pay the college or complex's tuition. It is a courtesy. They let us have the space free, so. You know, and please just make a small purchase of coffee or something when you're when you come in and sight. Think just common courtesy. Now, there are two rules for the college of complexes. Yeah. One is one fool at a time, and the other is no personal attacks. Oh. The uh, format of the college of complexes consists of the following: one, we will have a brief announcements period; two, we shall then have our speaker who will then speak up to an hour. We will then have question and answer period where we ask you for questions and, and uh, questions and answers. And then afterwards you get a chance to spot up with our infamous rebuttal period where you'll have up to normally four, three to five minutes depending on the amount of speakers and time. Tonight we're going to have a favorite of mine, Justin Tucker, chair of the Libertarian Party of Chicago. This presentation will analyze the classic book, Capitalism and Freedom, by the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. Justin Tucker will examine some of the ideas Friedman explores in the book, such as negative income tax and school vouchers, and discuss the impact that Friedman's book has had on the world. Friedman is noted for saying that there is no such thing as a free lunch. And perhaps maybe we can get Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to maybe read that same text. Because if that New Deal go climate change, New Deal goes in, we're going to be just like Venezuela. All right, let's welcome Justin Tucker. Okay. All right, thank you guys. Uh, thanks for everybody for coming out today. I really appreciate and I want to uh, or appreciate it very much. I want to thank the College of Complexes for having me back again. Um, some some things the LP Chicago is up to uh, on October twenty second on Reality Radio on W R L R ninety eight point three FM in Lake County. Sanj Mohip who ran for the uh, lieutenant governor in the last governor's race will be on the show along with Larry Sharp running for governor of New York. Uh, Libertarian Party Chair Nick Sarwark. Vermin Supreme will also be on the show. And, uh, and Senate candidate Preston Nelson will also be on the show from 5 to 7 p.m. So check that out. Where is it at on the web? Uh, just Google WRLR. Our next meeting will be... Uh, November 5th at the Piggery, our guest will be John Phillips, who's going to join us via Skype. John Phillips is running for the uh, vice presidential nomination at our convention upcoming in Austin. He also serves on the Libertarian National Committee. Adam Schuster? Adam Schuster uh, was there last month. Okay, so it's uh, oh D Dan Berman, right? I'm sorry. Uh... John Phillips is the guy who's, who's going to be at our next meeting. Not online. Versus Skype. I can only okay. Not online. Okay, well, all right. All right, it's not online yet, so cool. It's all right. One full of time, please. Uh, Germinal Van will be here uh, next month in November to talk about the, uh, the, uh, Problem with Egalitarianism, which is his latest book. And in December, we've got four Libertarian speakers here at the college, including Adam uh, and the candidate Joshua Flynn, myself, and Donald Meinshausen, who 
at the 68 uh, Young Americans for Freedom Convention lit his draft card on fire. So he'll come here and speak. Uh, so check that out. Um, if you're interested in the LP Chicago, I got a sign-in sheet uh, that uh, you can sign. Uh, my friends will pass it around uh, if you're interested. I also got Dan Taxation of Theft Bourbon Brochures in the back. He sent me some of the mail. So if you like what Dan Taxation the Steph Berman says he would be a delegate and vote for him to be our nominee as president. You got to join the Libertarian Party of Illinois by November 13th, and you can do that at lpillinois.org/join. Now, this talk is not an endorsement of uh, Milton Friedman's ideas uh, from the Libertarian Party. It's more an ex his, it's more of an examination of uh, his ideas uh, and the con and his contribution to libertarian theory. Um, the LP platform, nor its statement of principles, never mentions the word capitalism. Uh, and many libertarians are critical of some of the ideas that will be presented, uh, but I feel they're important to discuss nonetheless. Uh, biographical, uh, a quick biography of Milton Friedman. Uh, most of these details come from a PBS documentary called The Power of Change that aired in 2007. Uh, Milton Friedman was born in 1912 to immigrant parents in Brooklyn. He was raised in New Jersey. Uh, he attended a he attended uh, Rutgers University on a scholarship. And while he was in college, the Great Depression hit, and he was fascinated by the Great Depression. And he decided he was going to study economics at the University of Chicago. While at the University of Chicago, he studies under economist Frank Knight, Jeffrey Viner, who are yeah, influencers, I know. I know influencers of the Chicago School of Economics. And Frank Knight is perhaps Friedman's greatest influence. One of his classmates was an economist named Paul Samuelson. He was the first American to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Another classmate of his is Rose Director. Uh, sat next to him in economics, they began dating. Uh, he works for the National Resources Committee in D.C. during the New Deal. He works for the, he also works for the National Bureau of Economic Research in New York. 1938, he marries Rose. Uh, and during the war, ironically, Friedman devises a tax withholding scheme uh, to curb tax evasion during the war. Freeman's first child, Janet, is born in 1943, and his son, David, born in 45. David is also an economist. He's also a physicist and Give professor. Me in 46, Friedman becomes a professor at the University of Chicago. And Thomas Sowell, another noted economist, is one of his students. Communism spreads throughout Europe and other places following World War II. And causes much concern for the economist Friedrich von Hayek, also at the University of Chicago. And he invites Friedman and others to the first meeting of the Mount Pelerin Society, also seeking to challenge the Keynesian consensus. In 1957, a theory of the consumption function is published. In 62, Capitalism and Freedom is first published. It's later placed on Time Magazine's top 100 nonfiction books written in English since 1923. Uh, in 1963, he co-authored a book called A Monetary History of the United States with economist Anna Schwartz. He begins advising governments and politicians around the world, including Barry Goldwater during his presidential campaign and Richard Nixon as president. Along with his friend Alan Greenspan, who had become the chairman of the Federal Reserve, he fought to end the draft and advocated voluntary military service. Starting in 55, the Catholic okay, University in Santiago, yes. Chile, begins to send graduate students to study economics at the Soup. University of Chicago on scholarship. Uh, These students later become known as the Chicago Boys. What do you have in? In 72. Augusto Pinochet overthrows the democratically elected Salvador Allende with aid from the United States government. And the Chicago boys uh, begin to advise the military dictator on policy. Freeman later visits Chile 
uh, oh, during the trip, he meets with Pinochet, and he also gives a speech at a university. In oh. both uh, mm. the topics of discussion mm. for the meeting and Dream the speech, mushroom, beef, barley, were that economic freedom average. and prosperity requires Cream personal mushroom. freedom, which is also the topic uh, you ready, sir? of a chapter in Shrug. Capitalism and Freedom. Chile's, sure hope Chile's what kind economy of prospers, uh, and Pinochet is eventually yeah. moved from power via referendum Gravy. in 1988, no. which replaces yes. the what kind? military what kind dictatorship of with democracy. Of Friedman calls Beef this the miracle of Chile. Friedman wins the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1975, and his ceremony drink. is disrupted by... Protesters who were angry that he met with Pinochet. I'll take your, I'll take your menu. We can Freedom discuss that. He has a newsweet column and he frequently appears on he begins to appear on television and his influence is felt beyond economics. <coughs> In 76, the Freedmans moved to San Francisco where, where Milton becomes senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. 1980 saw the release of Free to Choose television series and book that Friedman co authored with his wife Rose. Free to Choose inspired reforms in post-Soviet Estonia, where they implemented a flat rate income tax paid by all but the poor. Free to Choose Network was founded after the release of the series and continues to produce educational content for PBS. Friedman becomes an economic advisor to Ronald Reagan, who gives him the President, Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1988. And in 2002, George W. Bush honors him at the White House for his lifetime contributions to economic thought. He dies in 2006 at the age of 94. Um, Capitalism Freedom is a great book, uh, but I'm, I can't cover it all in one talk. So specifically, I'm going to talk about the relationship between economic freedom and personal freedom, the role of government in a free society, the role of, edu of government education, occupational licensure, and the alleviation of poverty. Um, since I can't go over everything, I, I highly encourage everybody to please read the book. It's, it's really great. Uh, the book is part manifesto, part primer on the ideas of free enterprise, and part set of policy prescriptions. It was based on a series of lectures given at several universities that was sponsored by the Volkner Foundation and some previous published works of his. He thanks his colleagues at the University of Chicago, including Frank Knight and Friedrich von Hayek. And he commends his children's curiosity, forcing him to put technical, langu technical language into layman's terms. He also thanks his wife, quote, she pierced together scraps of the various lectures, coalesced different versions, translated lectures into something more closely approaching written English, and throughout, <laughs> been the driving force in getting the book published. The acknowledgement on the title page is an understatement. He subsequently refers to capitalism as our book, meaning him and Rose. Now, capitalism and freedom begins in the introduction by criticizing uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, Ask Not What You Could Do For Your Country speech. Friedman thought that this phrase was maternalistic and implied men were subservient to government. That's not what your country can do for you. Mm -hmm. You got it completely wrong. To the free man, the country is the collection of individuals who compose it, not something over and above them. He is proud of a common heritage and loyal to common traditions, but he regards government as a means, as instrumentally neither a grand grantor of favors and gifts, nor a master or God to be blindly worshipped and served. He recognizes no, no national purpose except as it's the, con, the consensus of the purposes for which the citizen se severally strive. Two broad principles uh, Friedman advocated um, in his kind of ideal version of man's relationship with government. Limited scope and power decentralized. Now Freeman admits many of the uh, admits that many proponents of centralization are well intentioned. 
Government can never duplicate the variety and the diversity of individual action. At any moment in time, by imposing uniform standards in housing or nutrition or clothing, government can undoubtedly improve the level of living of many individuals. By imposing uniform standards in schooling, road construction, and sanitation, central government could undoubtedly improve the level of performance in many local areas and perhaps even on the average of all communities. But in the process, government would replace progress by stagnation. It would substitute uniform mediocrity for the variety, for the variety essential for that experimentation which can borrow, which can bring to, uh, tomorrow's laggards above today's means. Now, Friedman defines capitalism as, quote, the organization of the bulk of the economic activity through private enterprise operating in a free market. Free market. It is extremely convenient to have a label for the political and economic viewpoint elaborated in this book. The rightful and proper label is liberalism. Unfortunately, as a supreme, if, if unintended compliment, the enemies of the system of private enterprise have thought it wise to appropriate the label. So liberalism has, in the United States, kind of a variety different, to have a very different meaning than it did in the 19th century, or does today over much of the continent of Europe. Partly because of my reluctance to surrender the term to proponents of measures that would destroy liberty, partly because I cannot find a better alternative, I shall resolve these difficulties by using the word liberalism in its original sense as the doctrines pertaining to a free man. So in chapter one, it's called The Relationship Between Economic Freedom and Political Freedom. It is widely believed that politics and economics are separate and largely unconnected. That individual freedom is a political problem and material welfare an economic problem. And that any kind of political arrangements can be combined with any kind of economic arrangements. The chief contemporary manifestation of this idea is the advocacy of, quote, democratic socialism by many who condemn out of hand restrictions on individual freedom imposed by quote totalitarian socialism in Russia and who are persuaded that it is possible for a country to adopt the essential features of Russian economic arrangements and yet to ensure individual freedom through political arrangements. The thesis of this chapter is that such a view is a delusion and that there is an intimate connection between economics and politics, that only certain combinations of political and economic arrangements are possible, and in particular, a society which is socialist cannot also be democratic in the sense of guaranteeing individual freedom. Friedman goes on to list two ways, uh, two ways of co coordinating economic activity of millions of people. Coercion and voluntary cooperation. The method of voluntary cooperation is called exchange. One feature of a free society is surely that freedom of individuals to associate and propagandize openly for radical change in the structure of the society. So long as the advocacy is restricted to persuasion and does not include force or other forms of coercion. It is marked of the political freedom of a capitalist society that men can openly Would you have advocate and work for socialism. Equally, political freedom in a socialist society would require that men be free yeah, to advocate. Yeah, as their soon as I get a minute, I've got people that don't even have drinks yet. I do apologize. And protected in a socialist society. Why protect them? Women. Who wants to protect them? So. Friedman is uh, very, he likes to drive this point home several times throughout the book. You cannot have economic freedom without political freedom. And that is, he's using the words available to him. He's calling this economic system capitalism. He's calling the philosophy that, in this tradition, liberalism. He goes on. 
and a free market society is enough to have the funds. The suppliers of paper are willing to sell it to the daily worker as to the Wall Street Journal. And a social society would not be enough to have the funds. The hypothetical supporter of capitalism would have to persuade a government factory making paper to sell to him, the government printing press to print his pamphlets, a government post office to distribute them among the people, a government agency to rent him a hall in which to talk, and so on. Next chapter, chapter two, the role of government in a free society. It's important to distinguish the day-to-day -day activities of people from the general customary legal framework within which these take place. The day-to-day -day activities are like actions of the participants in a game where they are all playing. The framework like the rules of the game they play. And just as good game as a good game requires acceptance by the players both of the rules and of the umpire to interpret enforcement enforce them, so a good society requires that its members agree on the general conditions that will govern relations among them, and some means of arbitrating different interpretations on, the, on the con these conditions, and on some device for enforcing compliance with the generally accepted rules. Friedman does talk about uh, the possibility of monopolies, and he does see that you know that you have to weigh certain options. Sometimes there are de facto monopolies wherein just the infrastructure revol uh, involved would require it such. Uh, he also made distinctions between regulated monopolies and then totally free, unfettered, laissez-faire. Um, and he did try to weigh these, you know. Monopoly. He thought monopoly was just as evil as coercion. So he did always try to think of ways where there would be more force. The role of government just considered is to do something that the market cannot do itself, namely to determine, arbitrate, and enforce the rules of the game. You must also want to do through government some things that might conceivably be done through the market, but that technical or similar conditions render it difficult to do that way. These are these all reduce to cases in which strictly voluntary exchange is either exceedingly costly or practically impossible. There is there are two general classes such a, of cases: monopoly and their similar market imperfections and neighborhood effects. Exchange is truly voluntary when nearly, when nearly equivalent alternatives exist. Monopoly implies the absence of alternatives and therefore inhibits effective freedom of exchange. In practice, monopoly frequently is not, if not generally, arises from government support or from collusion among, or collusive agreements among individuals. With respect to these, the problem is either to avoid government fostering a monopoly or to stimulate the effective enforcement of rules such as those embodied in our antitrust laws. However, a monopoly may also arise because it is technically efficient to have a single producer or enterprise. I venture to suggest that such cases are more limited than is supposed, but they unquestionably do arise. A simple example is perhaps the provision of telephone services within a com community. I refer to s such cases as technical monopoly. Freedom is a tenable objective only for responsible individuals. We do not believe in freedom of, for madmen or children. The necessity of drawing a line between responsible individuals and others is inescapable. Yet it means that there is an essential ambiguity in our ultimate objective of freedom. Paternalism is inescapable for those who we designate as not responsible. The clearest case, perhaps, is that of madmen. We're willing to neither permit them freedom nor, nor to shoot them. It would be nice if we could rely on voluntary activities of individuals to house and care for the madmen. But I think we cannot rule out the possibility that such charitable activities will be inadequate, if only because the neighborhood effects involved in the fact that I've been, 
involved in the fact that I benefit if another man contributes to the care of the same. For this reason, we may be willing to arrange for their care through government. Children are a more difficult case. The ultimate operative unit in our, family, in our society is the family, not the individual. Yet the acceptance of the family as the, as the unit rests in considerable part on expediency rather than principle. We believe that parents are generally best able to protect their children and to provide for their development to responsible individuals for whom freedom is appropriate. But we do not believe in the freedom of parents to do what they want with other people, with, to do what they will with other people. The children are responsible individuals in embryo, and a believer in freedom believes in protecting their ultimate rights. To put this in a different and what may seem more callous way, children are, not, are at one and the same time consumer goods and potentially responsible members of society. The freedom of individuals to use their economic resources that they want includes the freedom to use to use them to have children, to buy, as it were, their, the services of children as a particular form of consumption. But once the choice is exercised, the children have a value in and of themselves and have a freedom of their own that is not simply an extension of the freedom of their parents. The paternalistic ground for government activity is in many ways the most troublesome ground. For it involves the, ex the, accept the acceptance of a principle that some shall decide for others, which he finds objectable in, the, in most applications, and which he rightfully calls the home hallmark of his chief intellectual opponents, the proponents of collectivism in one or another of its guises, whether it be communism, socialism, or welfare welfare state. Okay. You gotta get moving here, so get moving. Oh, yeah. How long have I gone, Tim? About, about 30 minutes so far. Okay, well, I got a whole hour, so. No, no problem. I'm just letting you know. Alrighty. Yeah, just I think you were getting bogged down in two and it's still. I don't care, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can, you can, you can rebut me or something, you know. Okay. You got another half hour at least. Right. Well, right. Yeah. So chill out. Okay. Trust him. Trust him. Friedman says there can be rationalization for government intervention on the grounds of neighborhood effects. Circumstances under which the action of one individual poses significant cost on individuals which is not feasible to make him compensate them, or yields significant gains to other individuals for which it is not feasible to make them compensate him. And paternalistic concern for children who are irresponsible individuals. A stable and democratic society is impossible without a minimum degree of literacy and knowledge on the part of most citizens, and without widespread acceptance of some common set of values. Education can contribute to both. In consequence, the gain from, a ch from the education of a child occurs not only to the child or his parents, but also to the members of society. The education of my child contributes to your welfare by promoting a stable and democratic society. It is not feasible to identify the particular individuals or families benefited and so to charge for the services rendered. There is therefore a significant neighborhood effect. What kind of government action is justified by this particular neighborhood effect? The most obvious is to require that a child receive a minimum amount of schooling of a specific, specified kind. Such a requirement could be imposed upon the parents without further government action, just as owners of buildings and frequently of automobiles are required to specific standards to protect the safety of others. There is, however, a difference between two cases. Individuals who, can, who cannot pay the cost of meeting the standards required for buildings or automobiles can generally divest themselves of the property by selling it. The requirement can thus generally be enforced without government subsidy. The separation of a child from a parent cannot who cannot pay for the minimum required schooling is clearly inconsistent with our reliance on the family as the basic social unit. Moreover, it would be very likely to, detect, to detect, detract from his education for citizenship in a free society. If the economic burden imposed by such a schooling requirement could rarely be met by the bulk of the families in a community, it may still be feasible and, desir and desirable to require the parents to meet the cost directly. Extreme cases can be handled by special subsidy prov uh, provisions for needy families. There are many areas in the United States where these conditions are satisfied. In these areas, it would be highly desirable to impose to impose the cost directly on the parents. 
Freeman then goes on to be critical of government bureaucracies and uh, that manage the schools and how teacher salaries are based on certification, seniority, uh, etc., as opposed to merit. Government should require a minimum level of schooling financed by giving parents vouchers redeemable for a specific maximum sum per child spent on approved educational services. Parents could then be free to spend the sum and any additional sum they themselves provided on purchasing edu educational services from an approved institution of their choice. The educational services could be rendered by private enterprises operating for, pri for profit or by nonprofit in institutions. The role of the government would be limited to ensuring that the school is met with certain minimum standards, such as the inclusion of a minimum common content in their program, such as it, is, as it now inspects restaurants to ensure that they maintain minimum sanitary standards. An excellent example of this program of the sort is the United States Educational Program for Veterans after World War II. So one of Freeman's biggest uh, ideas this school voucher, he he modeled after the GI Bill. So he thought that he thought that school vouchers were a much better way of administering schools than they currently are now. Freeman went on to establish the Freeman Foundation for Economic Choice in 1996, which has now since been renamed Ed Choice. The overthrow of the medical guild system was an indispensable early step in the rise of freedom in the Western world. It was such a sign of triumph of liberal ideas and widely recognized as such that by the mid-19th century in Britain, the United States, and to a lesser degree the continent of Europe, men could pursue whatever trade or occupation they wished without the buyer leave of any government or quasi-governmental authority. More recent decades have been a, a retrogression an increasingly tendency for an increasing tendency for particular occupations to be restricted to individuals licensed to practice by them in the state. I shall discuss first the general problem and then a particular example: restrictions on the practice of medicine. The reason for choosing medicine is that it is, is that it seems desirable to discuss the restrictions for which the strongest case can be made. There's not that much to be learned by knocking down straw men. I suspect that most people, possibly even most liberals, believe that it is desirable to restrict the practice of medicine to people who are licensed by the state. I agree that the case for licensure is stronger for medicine than, most, than for most other fields. Yet the conclusions I shall reach are that liberal principles do not justify licensure, licensure even in medicine. And that in practice, the results of state licensure in medicine have been undesirable. So Friedman goes on to observe that licensure, that occupational licensure, that may be done, you know, he, he agrees that, you know, it could be done in the public interest, but in reality, he observed that it's mainly a means for industries to keep competitors out. Uh, bureaucrats and regulators are often usually staffed by people in the industry. Using the medical field as an example, he argues that licensure enabled by the American Medical Association limits the quality and quantity of doctors and <coughs> therefore diminishing a free, a, a, a potentially free market for health care. Suppose that anyone had to be had been free to practice medicine without restriction, except for legal and financial responsibility for any harm done to others through fraud or negligence. I conjecture that the whole development of medicine would have been different. The present market for health care, hampered as it has been, gives some hints of what the difference would have been. Group practice in conjunction with hospitals would have grown enormously. Instead of individual practice plus institutional hospitals conducted by governments or or institutions, there might have been developed medical partnerships or, co or corporations, medical teams. These would have provided central diagnostic and treating facilities, including hospital facilities. Some presumably would have been prepaid, combining in one package present hospital insurance, 
health insurance, and group medical practice. Others would have charged separate fees for separate services. And of course, most might have used both methods of payment. These medical teams, the department stores of medicine, if you will, would be intermediaries between the patients and the physician. Being long-lived and mobile, they would have a great interest in establishing a reputation for reliability and quality. For the same reasons consumers would get to know their reputation, they would have they would have specialized skill to judge the quality Greek of pork chop and rice. Indeed, they would be the agent of consumer in doing so, and the department store is now for is now for many a product. In addition, they could organize medical care efficiently, combining medical men of different degrees of skill and training, using technicians with limited training for tasks for which they were suited, and reserving highly skilled and competent specialists for the tasks they alone could perform. So Friedman uh, was imagining, speculating a what a healthcare, uh, a free healthcare system may have looked like had we not had interventions in the marketplace. What's the title of that book again? It's called Capitalism and Freedom. It came out in 1960, uh, early 60s, four, two, I forget which, which one I, uh, I said. Um, suppose what ex and this is a this is Friedman discussing the alleviation of poverty. Suppose what accepts as I do the line of reasoning is justifying government action to alleviate poverty to set as it were a floor under the standard of life of every person in the community. There remains the questions, how much and how. I see no way of deciding how much, except in terms of the amount of taxes we, by which I mean the great bulk of us, are willing to impose on ourselves for that purpose. The question how affords more room for speculation. First, if the objective is to alleviate poverty, we should have a program directed at helping the poor. There's every reason to help the poor man who happens to be a farmer, not because he is a farmer, but because he is poor. The program, that is, should be designed to help people as people, not as members of particular occupational groups or age groups or wage rate groups or labor organizations or industries. This is a defect of farming programs, general old aid benefits, minimum wage laws, pro-union legislation, tariffs, licensing, and so on, and seemingly endless profusion. Second, so as far, as far as possible, the program should, while operating through the market, not distort the market or impede its functioning. This is a defect of price supports, minimum wage laws, tariffs, and the likes. The arrangement that, that recommends itself purely on mechanical grounds is a negative income tax. We now have an exemption of $600 per person. This is the night in the early 60s. Under the federal income tax, plus a minimum 10% flat deduction. If the individual receives $100 tax to, taxable income, i.e. In, in income of 100 in excess of the exemption and deductions, he pays a tax. Under the proposal, if deductions income minus 100, i.e. 100 less than the exemption plus deductions, he would pay a negative income tax, i.e. receive a subsidy. So Friedman just thought it was much better to just give people money uh, as opposed to having all bureaucratic welfare system. He observed people in Chicago selling their food stamps and thought, well, I can just give them money. I want to close on this. The heart of the liberal philosophy is a belief in the, in, in, uh, in the dignity of the individual and his freedom to make the most of his capacities and opportunities according to his own lights, subject only to the proviso that he not interfere with the freedom of other individuals to do the same. This implies a belief in the equality of men in one sense and their inequality in another. Each man has an equal right to freedom. This is an important fundamental right precisely because men are different. Because one man will want to do different things with his freedom than another. And in the process can contribute more than another to the general culture of the society in which many men live. The liberal will therefore distinguish sharply between equality of rights and equality of opportunity. On the one hand, and material equality or equality of outcome on the other. He may welcome the fact that a free society in fact tends toward greater material equality 
than any other yet tried. But he will regard this as a desirable byproduct of a free society, not its major justification. He will welcome measures to promote both freedom and equality, such as measures to eliminate monopoly power and improve the operation of the market. He will regard private charity directly in helping the less fortunate as an example of the proper use of freedom. He may improve state action toward alleviating property as a more effective way in which the great bulk of the community can achieve a common objective. He will do so with regret, however, at having to substitute compulsory for voluntary action. The egalitarian will do this too. We'll go, we'll go this far too. He will want to go further. He will defend taking some to give the others. Not as a more effective me means whereby the some can that? achieve an objective they I, want I to can't. achieve on the grounds of justice. At this point, it, equality becomes sharply into conflict with freedom. One must you choose. Take yours? One cannot be both I got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. and a liberal. And I will end it right there. So thank you. Is that good enough for you, Tim? That was good. You forgot to mention the series Free to Choose in 1980. Oh. From the, that, that they really discounts Milton Friedman's thing. Really? I mentioned it at the beginning. Okay, now uh, I guess we'll go into questions. Do you need a moderator? Who does anybody want to moderate? Anybody? Well, we'll just let yourself. I'll go with the first one. <laughs> Milton Friedman, give me your views on why Milton Friedman considered freedom so essential under a free market. How do the two intertwine? Well, as I mentioned in my talk, basically. Uh, Basically, if you're going to, uh, if you want a free society, you need economic freedom okay. because it'll, it'll bring material wealth and also a greater, you know, higher standard of living, and the free, you know, people can cooperate voluntarily. Whereas a centrally planned government, the lead permission to, you know, as a, as a you know, very totalitarian social state, you require permission. <coughs> And you can't exchange ideas. You can't really exchange anything. So it's he, the ideal is a voluntary cooperation. Uh, who has a question? I raise your hand. I object to the moderator. I object to the moderator. Why? Why can't I be a moderator? Because you don't let people ask questions. You ask the question for them. You reword the question. And the last time I our question ends in a question mark. And. Yeah. What you're doing right now is an end in a question mark. Okay, let's uh, move on. I'm objecting to the moderator. Yeah. Uh, who, is this? who has the next question? Hi, I'm Gary. Well, let's give her a try. Let's, let's see how it goes. Hi, I'm Gary Levitt. I'm sorry I haven't done my homework. How would you feel about his book, Two Lucky People? Did you read Two Lucky People? I did not read about the book Two Lucky People. I did not read Two Lucky People. Uh, I'll have to read it sometime. But they, they did, from what I understand, they were very, uh, you know, they, they loved each other. They had a great romance. Uh, they're great partners uh, in you know, raising a family and also in their their fields. I attended his. Do you want me to continue order reading or do you want to? Yeah, you can read it. I attended, his, I, I attended his memorial tribute at Rockefeller Chapel. I did not know him, but um, a young lady cheerfully talked about how good a teacher he was. He must have been very inspiring as a teacher. And um, I was tempted to ask him, his widow and his son if they were religious, but Wikipedia said they were in their youth, but they some, somewhat this left This is a question period, sir. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All right. yes, thank you. Yes, George. Well, are, are libertarians conservative or liberal? Are libertarians conservative or liberal? I would say libertarianism is in the classical liberal tradition. Uh, in today's terminology, I don't think that they're either. They're what? Uh, so I, I, I think it's I think it's separate from conservative and liberal as as we understand those words today. A uh, question. <laughs> Can you distinguish between? Neoliberalism and what he calls liberalism? Neoliberalism is, I think, a term that is used by people to describe something that the people that they're describing don't use for themselves. Uh, I know it's become a popular epithet of late, and I know some people have taken the, the label as a badge of honor in a non-ironic way. Um, so I think some of the people who self-proclaimed neoliberals now are, are pretty much 
agree for the most part with with Milton Friedman, but I, uh, you know, Naomi Klein. I haven't read her book, but I and based on what I hear, some of you people say here, uh, he seems to be some sort of neoliberal boogeyman of some sort. So that's a word he never used for himself. Um, I mean, I described you know what he believes. So if you, I mean, have you read Naomi Klein's? Shock Doctrine, do you have an No, I did not read that, no. Questions? Mm -hmm. Talking about no. Okay. Uh, yes, Jean. Uh, what do you think, uh, from your reading, Milton Friedman would think of contemporary Chinese society and government? What would Milton Friedman uh, think of chi contemporary Chinese society and government? So, during the Free to Choose miniseries, he used Hong Kong as an example. I think he would... As he mentioned in his in his book, you need economic freedom for personal freedom. Uh, Hong Kong had been given a degree of autonomy for so many years, and we're under the influence of the English, and you know it's a port town. And we see now that uh, the people of Hong Kong do not like the Chinese communist Chinese government uh, ruling them, and they are fighting back. So I think Friedman would support the Hong Kong. Uh, uprising. I think he would encourage the Chinese government to make more free market reforms and to allow more personal freedoms. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan. Thank you for your talk, Justin. Uh, Milton Friedman called what happened in Chile a miracle. In Chile, for those of us who feel like what happened in Chile was a, a state-conducted terrorist attack, uh, what would you say to uh, persuade us or to give us points that that's incorrect? The, uh, the, the, um, the overthrow of the uh, democratically elected Chilean government by Pinochet uh, is not something I'm advocating or supporting. I don't think Friedman supported it. I'm pretty sure, I mean, I don't think he would have. Uh, he, uh, his, he spoke to many world leaders Pinochet was just one of them. He was not actively involved uh, in the coup. Um, he did not plan it. Uh, the miracle of Chile, uh, yes, it's, it's, you know, Pinochet was a bad guy. He killed many people. The miracle he was referring to was more that as he had, you know, the theme in the book, we need economic freedom to have personal freedom. The miracle was is that the people enjoyed the economic reforms that they did away with Pinochet, and that was the miracle. I, I don't think that Friedman condones Pinochet as a leader, but I, he would be, and he met with him and told him exactly what he wrote in his book. We need, if you want, you need economic reforms, you need uh, reforms for personal freedom. So Friedman was not in favor of Pinochet. The miracle was simply a re uh, in reference to the people rising up eventually after periods of economic development in overthrowing him through the ballot box. And just at the a referendum. quick five second follow up. The miracle continues to happen in Latin America. It seems so many people want to leave their country thanks to these miracles. Well, that's the only miracle. Uh, people are leaving Venezuela, not for anything but Friedman wanted to Socialism. Do. Travis. Uh, David Travis. David Travis. I'm sorry. Yes, um, did Pinochet invent that card game, Pinochle? <laughs> Brilliant question, thank you. Uh, I didn't read up on that in my research for this book, so I, can't, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, Dave Zucker. Yes, my question to you is, um, based on your reading of Milton Friedman, what would his opinion be of Donald Trump and Trumponomics? What would Milton Friedman think of Donald Trump? He would Trump. not like Donald Trump. He would hate the tariffs. He would hate the... Uh, he would hate, he'd hate the immigration. He would hate... Uh, the, I guess the protections now for farmers that are so that are affected by his tariffs. He would not agree with Trump on anything. I speculate. Ma'am. Sophia. Sophia. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, will you be a Democrat, or Republican, or is he a Libertarian? He was a member of the Republican Party. 
Um, he did that as a, as a in a sort of pragmatic sense. He, um, I'm sorry. It was just easy for him to get his ideas through the Republican channels than it was the Democrats and Libertarians. He identified. I mean, he he liked the word liberal. He would have he. Liberalism is how he is basically. His, this is his manifesto of liberalism. So I think his, uh, you know, I think he did use the word libertarian because it's just, it's the word you just, you know, you have to word, use the words that are available to you. So he was a small L libertarian, but he was never a member of the Libertarian Party. Charlie, you have a question that ends in a question mark? Yeah. We'll regulate the college, all right? <laughs> This, let us ask questions, all right? Tuition-free college hey, or complex? I'm serious. I don't need qualifications. If I don't ask them, I'm old enough to ask my he's, question, he's not all right? A we'll ask it, sir. So you got Charlie. that? Is that agreed to? That's yeah. the question? No, it's not. It's, it's agreed to the moderator, or else we're going to get a new Yeah, one. She, she, she'll go along with the all idea right. and he's ask your question. I'm old enough to ask questions, if you don't yes. mind, and I don't need to be pressed well, he's got experience. Now the time that that guy wrote that book, they just created the Environmental Protection Agency, which he opposed. And at that time, there were Love Canal and 50 Superfund sites of massive, massive, incredible pollution. And he comes out, why in the world is, is this intelligent person, how intelligent is he, to say in the, in the evidence of 50 Superfund pollution sites around the nation, and he says, oh, we don't need any regulation of the government. What did he say you didn't need any regulation from the government? In his book. Which book? In that book. He mentioned where, you know, which page it's no, on? I don't. Oh, I don't remember being in there. I don't think yes, he read the book. Yes, it is. He's noted for that. Uh, environment. Let me look it up here. Yes, I looked it up this afternoon. Environment. Environment. <laughs> He does talk about neighborhood effects and how pollution is a negative neighborhood effect. He is opposed to government question? regulation. What kind of person, in light of the evidence of what the free market capitalism had done to the country, comes up with a conclusion that there should be no regulation of the environment? Uh, it, I, I, to my knowledge, he never said that he didn't want any regular, you know, he was... Take my word for it, he did. Oh well, if you can't even you provided me a, a you cited something I that wasn't uh, correct. Me, so I, I, yes, I, I am. I, I think you're building a straw man. I made that up. I think you're bullshit. Yes. No, I made no. that up. I, I read it this afternoon. Jar. I'm going to clarify Charlie's question because you, uh, I read it this afternoon. Uh, the critique of this guy. Except that it's bad. Okay, well, if you disagree with his uh, policy of not supporting the the, uh, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, I don't know if that's the same as saying he was against right, regulation. Milton Friedman also. I gotta quiet down. In, I'm sorry. In light of all the pollution in the United States and mountaintop removal. Doesn't you already the, had your one question. Does the move party on. continue to oppose government uh, regulation? One question each. Okay, Tim Bolger, what is your question? All right. Could you verify that Milton Friedman also said that businesses should conduct all costs of externalities involved in the business, including the pollution costs of their operations? Uh, he did mention the neighborhood effects of pollution. They're negative. Uh, he didn't elaborate on that in this book. Okay. Um, I so if you have something that that he elaborates on, I'd like to read it to be more informed on Milton okay. Friedman's okay. position. Who has not had a question yet? Um, Kay over here. Sir. Oh, stand up if you don't uh, mind. So I was rereading the negative income tax chapter earlier. Uh, before I came here also, could you comment on that a little further and its connections possibly to the family of ideas referred to as universal basic income or basic income or the freedom dividend, sure. et cetera? Thank you. So the negative income tax is uh, basically Milton Friedman's version of what a universal basic income would be. Essentially, there is a minimum. If you make below the minimum, you get a subsidy. The closer you get to the minimum, you pay less of a subsidy, then you cross the threshold, then you start paying into the system. Um, so 
unlike uh, the freedom dividend that Andrew Yang is provide is is proposing, uh, Yang is adding this on to the current welfare state. He also wants Medicare for all. Yeah, I, I'm don't I'm, I'm sure he I'm, I think he probably still supports Social Security. What the what the negative income tax would do, Milton Friedman imagine it to be a replacement for the current welfare system. Yeah. So instead of the social security program and then like a welfare program and food stamps and housing subsidies, we'll just give you what well, we won't give you. Uh, if you if you make below a certain amount, we'll give you a subsidy. You make and then you pay in, you make above a certain amount, and that'll be your Raise your hand if you have a first question that you haven't Jim. Um, when I was younger, we had a great postal system, and now the postal great. system is divided among a great uh, among several private companies. At some point, the American postal system was de uh, it was demanded of them that they have a uh, savings account for seventy five years of of. Um, Pensions. pensions for their postal workers and postal costs went up a great deal I would say almost astronomically uh, Milton Friedman according to you tonight says that anything that can be done by private companies should not be done by the government and I would like you to defend the loss of our great postal system that was established during the Civil War and has now been, I think, ruined by private enterprise yeah. and the Republicans. Oh. All right, here's, uh, here's um, what Milton Friedman would have said about the Postal Service. Um, I conjecture that if entry into the mail carrying business were open to all, because the federal government, the post office, has a monopoly on delivering first-class mail. Um, if they were open for all, there would be a large number of firms entering it, and this archaic industry would become revolutionized in short order. So I think if he, he believed that if you opened up competition in delivering first-class mail, we would have a uh, flourishing of uh, parcel and post ser postal services. Uh, there is not a monopoly to deliver, par to deliver parcels, therefore you see UPS, you see uh, Federal Express, you see some of these other companies. So he, he believed, he conjectured, that post office would be even better if, if, it was, if other companies were allowed to compete. Okay, yes. how do you account for the 75 years of pensions that they have to put into a savings? Well, I, I don't know if Friedman would, I don't think Friedman would have not wanting those, you know, the, those pensions were promised to them. I'm sure he would maybe, I mean, I, I speculate he would support giving the pensions of, as promised. It sucks that the post office has to raise their rates to cover the pension system. That shows you kind of maybe how crazy their system was. Why? Uh, does anyone have a first-time question who hasn't asked a question before? Uh, uh, Andy yes, Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Have you uh, have you read any of the material showing uh, that the, the the raise in postal rates or the funding was designed to destroy the postal system as it is and turn it over to free enterprise? Have you seen? Any no, I've not seen that. Because there's a massive amount of evidence. All right. Next question, sir. Yes, I'm Gary. First of all, I wonder what Milton would have accomplished if he tried to run for office. And also, I wonder if any politicians currently mention him and then talk about him. Currently, politicians do mention him. Andrew Yang uh, oh, yeah. cites him as an influence on his freedom dividend. Uh, you know, there's the libertarian movement still holds, uh, and the conservative movement hold Milton Friedman in high regard because of his stances on free markets and, and defense of private property. So. I think uh, if he, I think he enjoyed being behind the scenes more. He had more greater, he had greater reach, being a popular popularizer of ideas and for yeah. being an influencer in Washington yeah. and for others around the world. Other I think he the probably world? around the world, around the world, yeah. yeah. 
Right. 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 Would, would a raise in the middle, <coughs> would a, a raise in the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, minimum wage? Minimum wage. The minimum wage, would, would, does that, that affect the poor adversely? It does because it, it's a, if you, anytime you increase the minimum wage, it's an increase on the, on the price of labor. So uh, I guess companies could be, you know, eating into their profits if they want to. But I think they may run out of money soon and then have to raise their prices. Uh, so it's, I mean, and then when, it, when the, you have to raise the prices to cover the cost of the increase of labor, it doesn't really, it, it kind of defeats its purpose. So I think that Friedman, Friedman advocated abolishing the minimum wage. I have a question. So wages should be 10 cents? <laughs> if people want to participate, if people want to agree to that, Wage. I doubt anybody would work for that. Sophia. Well, 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 All right, Charlie. Well, well, president, well, 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 Yes. I don't know if Friedman had a hand in that. It's possible. Yes, he did. He did? Yeah. He, and the contract with America was what? The I don't know if Friedman had anything to do with the contract of America either. Yeah, he, he's a Republican. Do you have a question? Yeah, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned Hong Kong. And Le, Lyndon LaRouche has a book, you know, saying Milton Friedman is a hoax. But this thing, he just, I mean, he just points out that with the argument about Hong Kong, that it there's a book named called Dope that it's the um, biggest. What's the question? It's what do you think about the fact that Hong Kong has become the number one purveyor of opium in the world because it's unregulated. It's a uh, you know so his example of capitalism without regulation and using the British yeah, so, East India uh, model, I capitalism guess that's without the democracy. That there. I mean, I, I guess it's. it's I, mean, it's I don't want anybody no to be the opium or or to die way? from opioid uh, addiction or overdoses. He says he's a fascist, basically. Oh, like mil All right, your question, question was answered. But, but if you're talking so about drugs, if you want to talk, bring it back to Milton Friedman. Friedman was an advocate of of ending the war on drugs. He supported legalization yeah, of all drugs. But the reality is opium, opium grows up in a deregulated market uh, of his okay, ideal, um, right, in Hong Kong. Jonathan. Uh, opium sales. In the 60s, King uh, advocated for the general basic income as well, and he seemed to get uh, more diverse economic support. I'm saying working class and middle class folks responded to the civil rights movement. Why did Milton Friedman choose not to join arms in solidarity with that movement of the civil rights movement? I can't speak specifically to that. He does have chapters in this book that talk about how capitalism uh, would uh, alleviate discrimination because if you're trading and engaging in uh, mutually beneficial exchanges, you don't seem to care what color the people are uh, that you're doing business with. Um, he probably would have advocated the property rights aspect uh, that, that Barry Goldwater had as far as like uh, co public accommodations. Um, and he, he thought that his uh, school vouchers and his, his negative income tax would help, um, you know, poor folks and working class folks. Why he never marched with King, I, I, I don't know, um, but he, he also, he he also said that you could, uh, boycotting is a perfectly good form of civil disobedience and a, and a, and a market mechanism. He, and he also, you know, if, if people, uh, the South, you know, imposed legal segregation, you know, and he was obviously against, you know, you could do business with anybody. Um, even if he did still support the, the kind of the property rights aspect of it. Um, he also, you know, if, 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 if a company has a reputation of, of discriminating against folks in their restaurant, then, you know, you can spread the word on how bad it is. Now we have Yelp and other sort of things, so. Would you say it's possible that was one of his greatest errors? Um, it's possible, we can it's, it's possible it's an error. Maybe he could have, uh, 
I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not aware of everything he's ever said on it. Maybe he has really good uh, articles about, you know, civil rights issues that I haven't read yet. Um, but I think his, I think that, uh, I don't believe that, you know. Okay, we have to um, ask, um, Dave Travis has a question. Uh, I question the capability of Charles Paydock to use a question mark. Uh, no personal attacks. No, no personal attacks. No personal attacks. No personal attacks. Yes. Yeah. One more Man, time. Man, you haven't had a question, Tam. Yes, it is. One more and you're out for the night. One pull at a time now, please, guys. All right, let's get order, please. Order. Order. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. All right. You mentioned about school vouchers, about being in favor of school vouchers. I think his position would be if they were the it would only be maybe maybe would if you're giving vouchers to any school uh, regardless of denomination I can still see an argument that that's you can't discriminate, like you can't, you know, like Christian and Jewish schools can get vouchers, but Muslim schools can't. I think that that would probably be where the violation might be. But uh, he doesn't address the separation of church and state issue, but I conjecture that that is um, probably the argument of why it wouldn't be if you could use it for all denominations and faiths. All right. Yeah. Yes, he, he did. In, he, when he talks about, he said that the, uh, the vouchers would go for approved schools. That, that Use the mic. We're not hearing you. Basic standard. Uh, okay, George. What's the main idea in the classic road to serfdom? It's that socialism and economic planning will always be uh, lead to totalitarianism because we've already built like the mechanisms yeah. that can be exploited for when somebody bad gets to power. That's the basic central plan. Central. I haven't read it all the way through. You did not have a question. Uh, 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 would you say that persons who work for the government should wear uniforms? Should they wear uniforms, all of them? Maybe, uh, I mean, uh, uh, not, I mean, I'm okay with governments creating their own dress forms for their employees. I don't think, you know, if the Postal Service wants everybody to wear blue and whatever, I guess that's their right, but uh, I don't know. Bob Lichtenberg, <laughs> you did not have a question? No, I did not. Do you think uh, charter schools, uh, what are the things that follow from Milton Friedman? economics in this book. Charter schools. Charter schools are not mentioned. I, I'd imagine no. he would favor them because they are, uh, they would compete with the the other public schools. Charter schools are public schools that are chartered, so, you know, all, like, the, the Pritzker, or the, uh, excuse me, the, uh, all the, the, all the charter networks, like Noble, they're not participating in the strikes because their teachers are non-union. I'm sorry. He does not mention charters in this book. He may have at later times or in other areas. I am unaware of if he did or not. Okay. Okay. Uh, God help me, Charles Paydock. All right. According to your blurb, this guy said there's no such thing as a free lunch. So come in November, are you opposed to uh, Thanksgiving Day? Churches and community groups offer free Thanksgiving. No, I'm not. He wouldn't be opposed to it either. Like, he, do, you, he, do you think they should put a sign up instead that says there's no such thing as a free lunch? I don't, uh, well, if they, if they felt that it was okay to do, they could have that right. I wouldn't do it if I was doing that. But, I mean, there's nothing, uh, nobody's being forced to provide, you know, no, there's no coercion in providing people with free. Uh, Food from a kitchen or from churches on Thanksgiving. 
it's, it's not mandated by government. People aren't forced to do it. It's people doing it out of the goodness of their own hearts. Well, look, it's what real charity is, not that fake charity which involves robbing people and redistributing the loot follow that you think is charity. Follow Next question. question. Follow-up question. On the Libertarian website, I just read this afternoon that if you give some, something to somebody, it results and they don't have any incentive to work. So don't give anybody anything. What's the question? Isn't that on the website? If you give something free to somebody, it destroys incentiveness. Uh, it, it, it can in certain instances. I don't know what you're referring to on my website specifically. But, yeah, I mean, if people uh, aren't, I mean, it's very, it's, I mean, it's not hard to imagine if people just can uh, get something without any, you know, if, if something doesn't belong to them, they have no incentive to take care of it. If they're just going to be getting something and it meets their basic needs, they're not going to have any, why would they want to, uh, even if in, in the current welfare state where getting a job jeopardizes your benefits, why would anybody be motivated to possibly lose your benefits? So the poor people are lazy. Ellen, you haven't had a question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I assume that Miller Friedman was um, opposed to Medicaid, and I'm wondering how he would propose that um, people of limited income would pay for surgery, necessary surgeries or cancer treatment. They would get their like stipend <laughs> from the, uh, their, their, they'd get their minimum basic money if they were poor. Was he, did he actually think that a stipend of, how big would this stipend be? Because he also, because uh, like a, a, a surgery, I mean even, even like uh, filling a couple cavities, that's like almost $1,300. So Friedman uh, in, the, in the occupational license chapter talked about how the American Medical Association limits the supply of doctors. There's almost an infinite demand for health care, but uh, doctors need to have X amount of training and can only go to certain hospitals, or excuse me, go to certain uh, medical schools to get a degree, and then that's how you become a doctor and you can't you can't practice medicine outside of these rigid standards so what he imagined was that if we got rid of uh if we got rid of licensure then good doctors could be more specific in their in their specialty not as good doctors may be able to do phlebotomy or whatever he he envisioned almost a supermarket of of uh supermarket of medical care and, and Gary Johnson during the 2016 campaign okay. uh, he envisioned something similar he, he called it like right. you know kidneys are us gallbladders are us uber uh, <laughs> uber whatever uh, so Milton okay. Freeman thought that a, a, de a deregulated market would create flourishing there'd be competition for pricing you could uh, you'd be aware of how much procedures would cost. Can I buy a dessert? Last question goes to Raj, who hasn't had a question. Thanks. Uh, you would try here. Um, can, can I have a supply of doctors? Uh, can I buy it? Can you supply more doctors? Yeah, can you give me one minute? I gotta start plan, collecting no, checks. To supply more doctors was needed to not let them, to, to let them practice medicine without a license. That was his plan. Would you go to a doctor like that? If he was, act, if he was actually good, why not? And if, they, if I can check, like, you know, Yelp and see what the reviews say. Like, uh, like I'll give you an example, a real life example that I read in another book. Medics in the military, they, can, they are not doctors, but they can fix broken bones, they can make little procedures. They do that under pressure in the battlefield. I don't see why we can't let them provide. The, you know, use that training they, they got in the military and apply it to civilian life, uh, operating, you know, uh, performing these services for people who need them. I, I, if somebody can mend a broken bone and he's had experience doing it and he's done it a bit while being shot at, I'm sure he can fix my broken bone. How about brain surgery? Um, brain surgery, maybe, you know, I probably want to go to a brain doctor. I'm go to anybody, go. right? Before we go to rebuttals, um, I want to remind people um, to be sure to pay their checks. Heather's going to be coming up with checks soon. I'd like to thank our speaker, and we're going to go on to rebuttals.
All right, thank you. All right, how, how many were speaking? We'll go about four minutes apiece. I was going to ask, I didn't do my homework, but okay. there's libertarianism. Go about four minutes. Is somebody uh, timing? One is like. All right. Go ahead and give you a first rebuttal. Oh, uh, really? A personal complaint. Uh, I am a customer of insurance companies. And those insurance companies that I pay money to every month, and I am their customer, they tell me who I can go to for their services. And this is something I object to very strenuously. I think if I pay for medical insurance, I'm a customer Here, of the sir. insurance company, oh, that's, thank not you so much. a person oh. who should be directed by the insurance company to tell me what I have to do. Yeah. Um, you can get it if you pay more for your insurance. There's a choice. Hey, are you doing this for me? Okay. Um, there, were, there were several things going on. Um, the statement was made that family, families are the best people to care for their children, which would eliminate FBS, whatever they call it. DSF. DS, DSF. A. DCFS. And there are there are there are examples after examples after examples of families that don't adequately care for their children, and. Uh, the, the government intervenes is a good thing, although it does get out of hand. You've got to admit that. Um, and then as far as education goes and, and charter schools, charter schools have to be approved. And if you're going to send your child to charter schools, then you should pay for it. But we're finding that the charter schools are applying for money and the government is... is um, Slipping money from the education fund into paying for charter schools that are supposed to be private. Um, and another thing is, uh, doctors have a way of policing the people who become doctors. There's lots of slip-ups, and they often make the news. But lawyers don't seem to have this facility. And there are hundreds of thousands of slip-ups that don't make the news in lawyering. And I think that lawyers, there should be a guild of lawyers that restricts people who could call themselves lawyers. And when they, um, when lawyers do things that are unethical and Ill Ill illegal, that they should be brought before a tribunal and perhaps uh, their standing in court should be taken away. Yeah. This is extremely rare. It does happen, but it's extremely rare. Not like with doctors. If doctors are quacks, the AMA finds out about it pretty fast. Yeah, I know and, about incompetent lawyers, that's for sure. And uh, another thing about the free lunch. People misinterpret that. When, when I guess Milton Friedman said there's no such thing as a free lunch, that is utterly, absolutely, totally true. When you get a free lunch, somebody's paying for it. You might get it free, but somebody's paying for it. And there really is no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to say a couple, uh, one paragraph from uh, uh, Friedman's book, uh, Free to Choose. He tells how he got so smart. Uh, the only person who can truly persuade you is yourself. You must turn the issues over in your mind at leisure. Consider the many arguments. Let them simmer. And after a long time, turn your preferences into convictions. That's how he got so smart. Uh, and more basic, to keep your options open until circumstances make change necessary. That's all. I just want to read that. All right. <laughs> I wonder who his teachers I'd like to thank the speaker. I thought he did a really good job. 
Uh, I know we put him to the test. Even my question put him to the test. So uh, thank you on that. Uh, the second point is that I don't think he mentioned Rand Paul and Ron Paul. Ron Paul, I think, was the father from Texas, I yeah, believe, and Rand Paul is a senator from Kentucky. So uh, they weren't mentioned. They're both, I think, in the Republican Party, but I think they were more or less libertarians, close to uh, freedmen. Uh, the last point is, uh, in my opinion anyway, uh, racial discrimination and the market do not exactly go together. There are a lot of times when whites say no to black and other people of color, uh, and they lose money. So uh, I don't know how that fits together, but that's, I think he tried to address that. Thank you. My name is Raj Patel. I'm a good, great fan of uh, Peter Drucker, and uh, what Peter Drucker believes that what uh, Friedman believes are exactly opposite thing. Peter Drucker believes that uh, businesses have a social responsibility and uh, he have to care for the people and customers and, and people at large. And it looks like a Friedman doesn't believe that at all. He believes in that it's indirectly business to it work and it will happen. The, there has been so much literature on the internet about, about these two, they never solve the problem. The, the, my, my feeling is that, that uh, oh, looks like ordinary people did not exist in a great man's world. He, he, he's talking about business and business world. He's not talking about uh, his impact and his health of ordinary people. The truth is there, and it was important. I don't the current, sir. Current current world, that the ordinary people did not have much knowledge to manage their own affairs, their own economic affairs, and uh, lots of lots of things comes in their life. They cannot manage it. Like a Charlie Bung, uh, uh, the what do you call it? Uh, the, the, what do you call it? That, that's so, I forget, I cannot remember right now. And, uh, the union, and uh, my, I have a theory on union. I, th I think Karl Marx probably had done more for ordinary people than any of these other guys, including Jesus. Karl Marx, Karl Marx brought first idea that uh, stakeholders in a business and uh, their share is negotiable. A, a, a baker, his assistant, the owner, and what money they will share from the income is a negotiable. It looks like uh, uh, Friedman says that it's it's, a, it's a all up to the businessman and not the people at large working in that particular establishment or uh, in a business. And uh, one of the one of the lecture one of the not lecture on the internet his speech I read. Okay. And uh, perhaps in a late in his life he was convinced people are gonna walk up. that whatever he expects that's not going to happen. Because fundamental thing had changed in our society. That we do, we expect government to take care of the people. And and that thing that thing is sad. And our policy either Republican or the Democrats. Okay, yes. they, we are added to social security, we are added to medical service, medical health, we are added to government involving uh, involving the licensing, we, we are added to government doing everything, involving everywhere. And so, so, Friedman's world is gone. And the other, the last, last point, with artificial intelligence, we are going in absolutely different world. 
And uh, there's lots of, lots of, lots of conversation right could, now. I'm sorry to ask that you, but you can't meet sooner than later. Well, because I don't I know where they're going to collect. That means we can make his own decision <laughs> better than we can make Perfect. decision Thank for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next. Good evening. I'm David Travis. Uh, I'd like to say that I very much appreciated the uh, the talk that uh, Justin Tucker gave tonight uh, in view of the uh, people that gave him a hard time. Uh, I think he did very good. I also want to say that I like I like Milton Friedman very much, and I want to say that I had the pleasure of having dinner with his son. I believe his yeah, name was David uh, Friedman. I had dinner with his son many times my, in Chinatown, and uh, he was an extremely intelligent man, uh, and a pleasure to talk to. Uh, I um, that that's really about all I've got to say. I, I only have good things to say about Milton Friedman. So uh, that's about where I'm coming from, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. All right, next. Next. All right, order, please. You already know that I am much more democratic socialist in my economic theory than capitalist. Now. Capitalism started out with a noble and a high motive, but like most human systems, it fell victim to the very thing it was revolting against. So today, capitalism has outlived its usefulness. The solution to poverty is to abolish it directly by a now widely discussed matter, the guaranteed income. The curse of poverty has no justification in our age. It socially is cruel and blind as a practice of cannibalism at the dawn of civilization. That's uh, Martin Luther King Jr. who uh, also talked about all of these same issues and seemed to be someone that Milton Friedman could never find to call on the phone. So this is in honor of King. <clears throat> Forgive me if I'm a little bit off key. And Tim, feel free to cut me off if I go 20 seconds over. <laughs> and he's the one taking time. <laughs> I have earplugs in the back if anybody starts to get sick. <laughs> Lots of folks, they say, is leaving home every day. Beat that hot and old dusty way to the California line. Cross the desert sand, we roll, get out of that old dust bowl. <coughs> Think they're gonna go to a sugar bowl, but here's what they find. Now the police at Port of Entry say you're number 14 million for today. Oh, if you ain't got the do re me, if you ain't got the do re me, well, you better go back to beautiful Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Georgia, Tennessee. California is the garden of Eden, paradise to live and see. But believe it or not, you won't find it so hot if you ain't got the door in me. You want to buy a home or a farm that can't deal nobody any harm. Take your vacation by the mountains or the sea. Don't swap your old cow for your car. You better stay where you are. You better take this tip from we the peeps. Cause we look through the one ads every day. And we don't believe a single word Milton Friedman has to say. <laughs> Next. Well, my name is Gary Levin. It's been too long since I've been to the college. I'm a survivor of mistreatment. Well, I, I attended Milton Friedman's tribute at the Rockefeller Chapel, and I didn't know him, and I wasn't a student there, but some people uh, were very 
praising of him, a young lady talked cheerfully about how important he was as a teacher for her. And uh, so it was really nice. It seems like just the other day, but it was probably years ago. When did he pass away? 2006. Oh, how do you like him? Well, I'm a survivor of mistreatment by police, mental health care, the school system, the guardian. And I know someone in the Grove Nursing Home. I don't know that they want me to talk about it. This is a scandal of major proportions. I've often thought of killing myself. The reason I don't is because I have a loved one who I need to protect. And anyone who goes after her is going to be like a gnat under the foot of Hercules. I know how to think straight because I've worked with therapists for many years who are absolutely incompetent. And lawyers can hurt you, and the police, and, and I've been kicked out of one place after another. I got kind of kicked out of Pequot Pizza for no reason, I don't know why. I was pretending I was a hunchback of Pequot, there were some low-lying uh, uh, decorations. Two police officers came, and one said, I, if I was my house, I wouldn't have to tell you why you can't come, which is authoritarian. And it's like a Leslie Nielsen movie. Uh, this other one said, uh, you're not being punished. You just can't come back the rest of your life. You, you can't make this stuff up. I can't believe it. It's like the Twilight Zone. Why did Rod Serling die at 50? And Mao, the murderer, die at 80? Why, God? So i got to give a presentation somehow. The trouble is I don't do anything on the media. I'm online. I don't learn like a five-year-old about blogging. I'd like to do TED Talks. I'd like to do that. And I'm glad I hung in there. And, Joint uh, postmaster. Today I went to the University of Chicago, Manage Day Open Out. Oh, is it great? It. I got on the bus at 7.05 <laughs> at Nile Center in Maine, and I uh, had a good lunch, and I'm not depressed. I had a good meal, not depressed. And um, I, um, it's just, you know, it's just great to hang in there and not give up. Because when you hear about a woman being taken from a car and she's killed, and women are trying to avoid being tortured and killed, you know, you can't, you can't uh, feel too sorry about yourself, but I, I know I have something to offer. And um, I've never had a girlfriend, but um, I'm getting closer to, uh, to doing it. You know, I, my glands aren't as good as they used to be. Probably the only problem I have is a premature fainting. A what? Premature fainting. Oh, that's a little joke. Okay, well, I'll do my, my funny sense of humor. Uh, if you didn't have a... I'd like to win the, Pulis, the Nobel Prize in Psychology and Humor. They're not even offered. I really have a tremendous sense of humor. I can't really take credit for it. I'm an overachiever. You know, you don't know what you'll do when you're inspired. It's very great to be inspired by you people and uh, you're inspired by UFC. I'm, I wish I loved lectures when I was in school, but better late than never. So I didn't really know for sure what I'd say, but uh, it's great to be here, and I so value the college. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, next. Hi, I'm Ellen Corley, and uh, I also love the free um, speech forum idea, and uh, the free market, I'm a little more dubious about, but thank you um, for your talk. I, it's actually um, interesting, you know, as I've told some people that my stepfather was friends with Milton Friedman and pretty much raised me on him uh, and Ayn Rand and libertarianism from age 10 to a few years ago. And uh, I, what my, that's why I think it's interesting to develop um, a criticism of his thinking and here's my ideas are that it's, I think he, he talks about individualism in a kind of ideal way, you know, and this is the problem with the economics that he basically, you know, uh, his economics are what is given in school. It's, actually, they didn't, they don't require macroeconomics as much anymore. Um, and I, the problem is, I, I just don't think any of it's based in real world science. It, it, it's theory, you know, um, like individualism. A person could do this, but then it would be nice to see it, uh, you know, based in in reality. Uh, because actually, my stepfather, he must have gotten it from Milton Friedman, would say, sociology proves nothing. And I, I've gotten where I want to say, sociology proves everything, you know, because sociology. I'm, Looking at the book today of the social worker is, it's dealing with problems. You know, there's real big problems like you know starving people, inequality, um, you know the uh, 
uh, you know, rape of women and patriarchy. And um, uh, unfortunately, I wanted to ask you, like, what does, you know, what do you see the, in, you know, the result of Milton Friedman's theories has been put into practice? You know, um, if any, you could look at any sociological situation, you know, Hong Kong or... Um, any country. Right, anywhere. It just, uh, and you know, they were saying this Pinochet, uh, we, it's like we think we, it's like a court case. And, you know, he's going to win because he's just deductive logic. He's not looking at it inductively. That's what science is, is looking at, you know, what is really happening. And he, he was great at making these arguments and, um, Here. but, you know, it, what I've come to think is about forensic history is that um, this book that Lyndon LaRouche has taken him on and explains a lot um, that he says that his ideas came from the East Indian, you know, um, East, like AIG, you know, the East India Company formed America, right? And so we are a, a corporate state, right? And it's one thing to say, oh, wouldn't it be nice not to have a corporate state? We could, you know, be more creative and competitive. But, you know, the reality is there is a kind of fascist corporate state, and, you know, it's kind of real. And I think a lot of us, more, you know, demo the, definitely they've been repressing the communist state for a long time. I, and basically they used, you know, Ayn Rand and, um, you know, to to come up with a propaganda campaign. That's what neoliberalism is, neoconservatism, to, uh, you know, kind of neo-fascism. They're all the same thing. They're basically little propaganda campaigns to kind of cover up you know, what is really going on. He was stupid. Um, there, he talks about, it, it, it's worth really pushing back on Friedman and Ayn Rand that there's, I mean, like, if you take it to the logical extent and read him, he, he would have no welfare, no, uh, you know, he says people who are unemployed should go apply to the charities. I mean, and this kind of thinking is, Unfortunately, you know, it seems to be a growing movement, especially in this complex, uh, you know, um, that, and I, you know, it is very deceptive because without life experience, like, you really don't understand human rights until you realize you don't have any, and, and there's no way to get any. I, my stepfather, by following that theory, ended up being taken by a Republican Trump person, and he did hate Trump. But he, you know, he didn't believe in God, didn't believe in helping others, doesn't believe in, um, you know, thinks the environmentalism is a religion, don't believe in it. You think you could just individually decide, I'm not going to believe in this. Well, you know, then you stop believing in it, you stop believing in it, and, and the anarchy, which I guess is technically an anarchist, is um, really can lead to, uh, like, you know, the New World Order is really controlling things, and, you know, we're all kind of clueless, you know, marching towards it. And it it's really is fascist propaganda. We need to have a talk on that. It's, um, you know, Jason Stanley's written a great book about it. And, and this is not conservatism. What Trump's doing, and he is, you know, a logical extension of what Milton Friedman was describing. It is, you know, it's all capitalism, and um, capitalism and democracy are different. Michael Parenti's books, Democracy for the Few, is a great primer on that. It, you know, when I first saw that, I go, are you allowed to actually read this book, you know, that explains the, he's, he's brilliant, Michael Parenti. I, I should give a talk just on what he says. But he basically is uh, calling the bluff, you know, of this. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I am going to tell you guys now about the greatest poverty reduction system in the world. The one that has gone in 
and basically brought the world into a prosperity that's been proving itself for well over 300 years. And that is a good old-fashioned capitalist system with globalization. And if any of you guys doubt me, take a look at what's happened in the world in the last 100 years alone. Even up to now, there's been a significant reduction in absolute global poverty. We've seen the lifespans of people extending quite a bit more. We have seen the tremendous benefits of globalization. In the early 2010s, before 2010, we saw the rise of three, almost three, United States economies in, in just India and China alone. Under Mao, China suffered. When they opened up their markets, we are now seeing the benefits of that. The one thing I am seeing around the world, though, now that we're not really doing right is the abject, abjectification of the people wanting to promote their freedom. We've seen a rise in the relative number of dictatorships and the rise in this stupid socialism that has crippled economies for the last 30 years. And why young people are believing in socialism today simply behooves me when we have the full and frontal evidence that capitalism delivers the goods. Even in the so-called Victorian age, when you had the large corporations coming in, the world was brought into electric power. You had the power of the railroad. You had steam engines. And yes, the development of oil, which at the time was much, much cleaner than coal. What you need today is to continue this globalization with a much more better and more efficient power source. That would be what I've advocated in the past, the development of low-cost, safe, nuclear power that will help keep the world cheap, get us off fossil fuels, and have a market demand for cheap energy. Once you get that unlimited energy into an economy that can be uh, well taken care of, you'll see more instances of recycling. You'll see more instances of environmental caring and all that stuff. But if we go now with our heavily reliance on renewables, which is basically a roadmap to nowhere, we're going to see something crazy. The amount of land it would take, the amount of resources it would take is almost astronomical. Yes, I'm a fan of Milton Friedman. When you have capitalism, the natural outgrowth is freedom. The reason why we are free in the United States is because we've had freedom of choice, property rights, and the enforcement of contract law. And that's a lot of what our freedoms are based on. We also have human rights, and they too are constitutionally guaranteed. Because of the power of the lawsuit, we've been able to get a lot of things done, hold corporations accountable, and yes, I do believe in unions because given the major power of some corporations, you need a good countervailing asset for it. Capitalism rules, it's delivered the goods. Socialism <coughs> in its full manifest form will simply lead to what Friedrich von Hayek said, you have no choice. And in socialism, everybody's poor. Go to Don't say our freedom in Scandinavia country. Freedom isn't their freedom in Scandinavia. What's going on? Sweden, Finland, Denmark. On the subject of socialism, I would say the following. I am not myself a socialist, nor have I ever been. I'm a liberal, a Democrat, and from that standpoint, a liberal candidate. But to say that socialism is always bad, and that it always comes up with bad ideas, is ridiculous. They denounced Social Security when President Roosevelt first sent it to Congress. They say it's socialism. Well, it helped millions of older Americans um, live a decent life, not live out their lives in poverty. When, when they talked about government funding for the arts, they said, well, that's socialism. Well, President Kennedy got it through, and I think that the American life, America, our American life has been vastly enriched by, this, by government funding for the arts. 
And when the then governor of California, a Republican named Earl Warren, okay. yes, that Earl Warren, oh, that must um, be posed a modest, but it was more than most Republicans. Oh, oh, and, uh, where is he going? A modest bill for medical insurance for all hey. to the California hey. legislature. <laughs> the California, he vetted it first in a speech for the California Medical Association. They denounced it as socialism, socialism. The result being that the bill was defeated in the California legislature, much to Governor Warren's uh, annoyance. So, I'm sorry, I don't think socialism is always bad. Is it always good? No. That's why I'm not a socialist. But to say that it's always bad is just plain wrong. What are you? What are you? <laughs> I'd like to thank our speaker tonight for uh, a good presentation for a variety of reasons. For those of you that aren't familiar with Greta Thunberg, uh, she's given speeches all over the place on why we have to take action now as a species. <clears throat> One of her talks to world leaders, she said, why aren't people acting on evidence they can see right in front of their face? She said, are they evil? She says, no, they're uninformed. There's a lot of kind, decent people everywhere. They're uninformed of the basic facts because of the media in this country that runs coordinated blackouts on certain kinds of substances. I've been giving talks here since 2007 on the concept of censored news and that book that comes out every year from Sonoma State for the top 25 blacked out stories. I mentioned two books at the earlier talk tonight that are summaries of a very large body of scientific evidence. Now this one, HIV, AIDS, the greatest lie of the 21st century, this is a summary of the work of thousands of scientists, many of them with Nobel Prizes. Now, a lot of people will stand up at the podium right after I, I talk about this and say, I haven't read the book or cracked the book on any of this, but they say, oh, all those guys with Nobel Prizes are denialists. That's, that term, uh, conspiracy theorist and denialist, was made up by our CIA when anybody wanted to talk about the assassination of Kennedy. When you want to talk about the reality of blacked out subject in America, they call you a conspiracy theorist or a denialist. Well, the evidence is overwhelming. The answer is in. The earth isn't flat. Smoking four packs a day is not good for your health. And HIV is not the cause of many of the illnesses that were diagnosed and misdiagnosed as AIDS. A lot of sick people died but they were dying from the medicine. The treatment was, the virus was harmless, the treatment was fatal. That's the short version of it. And you can look up any number of books. Anyway, this one, the new <coughs> the only client, the Green New Deal, summarizes how much time we have, what the problem is, and I didn't hear anything in our speaker's talk tonight about what's happened. <coughs> As I said, Greta said, people aren't inherently evil, they're just not informed. <laughs> Hannah Arndt from Germany, some of you may be familiar with that name, she wrote about the Nazis. She, uh, she used the term the banality of evil. Yep. Ordinary people <laughs> can do incredibly evil things, just going about their business, doing their jobs, and staying on this side of the barrier, not facing reality. There's a DVD out you can get from the library right now, a, a, a video, it's called The Brainwashing of My Dad. It's written by a, made, a, a documentary made by a woman who saw her dad gradually changing as he was sitting watching television until she found out he was watching Fox News. He used to be a kind, decent person, and he turned into one rabid son of a bitch. Uh, personal that, attack. That's not a personal attack on anybody. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a statement of fact about what happens to these people that turn into hate monitors, watching the hate monitors on Fox News. That's the term that's used in textbooks. 
fourth thing, I found out, you know, listening to our, 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 our speaker tonight <laughs> is like listening to somebody give the, uh, the finer points of the fine road trip documented route that was taken through Dallas, Texas. Well, other than that, Mrs. Kennedy, how was your trip to Dallas? Well, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how, was your, how did you like to play? <laughs> well, other than the disaster in Chile, uh, what about the miracle in 1989 when they got democracy? Yeah, they finally overthrew the dictator that had devastated that country with Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys running an experiment down there. You, in order to give a talk like this, you have to be living in a bubble, not exposed to any of the information that was published in the late 70s, 80s, 90s. There's tons of stuff on the disaster, the disaster in Chile from Milton Friedman's crackpot ideas, <laughs> followed yeah. by the, the Milton Friedman's crackpot. idea of trickle-down economics. We got trickle-down in 1980 with Ronald Reagan. And that, that was finally proposed also. So Milton Friedman has been widely discredited. Yeah, he has a Nobel Prize. Well, yeah, but he's been But these widely Nobel Prize people so use Cyro uh, It depends on what you're talking about. And I think they wouldn't give him a Nobel Prize today after seeing the evidence of what he produced. But at any rate, <laughs> there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good. We hear all the time about how capitalism has brought us freedom. Yes. Uh, Unfettered capitalism has brought us right up to the point where somebody leaps off the 98-story building and they're flying down and says, the trip is great, I'm flying, I'm flying, I'm flying. And they don't pretend, uh, you know, you take a look at what the landing might be like. The 1997 professor John McMurtry out of Canada produced a book called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. We're living in that today. He said in 1997, if you don't regulate billionaire sharks, if you don't regulate them, they'll get bigger and bigger like sharks. And un unregulated capitalism, the libertarian view, the libertarian utopia, in other words, these billionaire sharks with no ethics, morals, and conscience will eat everything in sight and destroy a country. And they're in the process of destroying the planetary environment that the human race depends on to survive. We got 11 years to deal with these psychopathic predators. We got to get something started in the next year or two. This is why millions and millions of people are protesting all over the planet. I'll talk about this more in, in a week or two. But uh, just log on to Common Dreams. The last thing I'll tell you, articles about these books and summaries. If you don't have to read time to read whole books, read the summaries of them every day that show up on Common Dreams and the Smirking Chimp. Those two sites are excellent for authors that publish summaries of their work and large summaries of the database. Okay, thank you much. All right, Charlie. All right. Last but not least. Let's thank our speaker and creative for helping out tonight. All right, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, uh, correction, Timmy. One of the things when socialism was implemented within China, and the Soviet Union, the first thing that were addressed were uh, situations that, that they wanted to correct civil rights, human rights, such things as the ability to manage rights. I don't like to say posters. They launched a campaign that women should be able to read and everyone in the society should be able to read. They thought that was a basic right yes, to information. And they didn't set about anything else. They looked at the human beings. The other thing they did was they, they took away the yoke of the landlords or the warlords and, and replaced the it with the yoke of slavery the in Siberia. And promise which they hadn't had before. They lived in periods of darkness and, and oppression. And for that, there, there's nothing you can, you can match that with. Yes, all right, I can. First of it's all, regarding Jonathan asked Let a very poignant right. question. And there's a very common criticism of your favorite, your favorite guy. Now you got to be cautious about these guys. They take ethics and they manipulate it. They don't, they don't really understand ethics. But one of the things about criticisms of Milton Friedman is, is that he has very little mention or identi identifies in any way, shape, or form with what is known as civil rights. Amazingly enough, that book was written two years before the Civil Rights Act. 
was passed. And I guess he, he merits some sort of immunity from what was going on within the American society at the time. This Nobel Prize winning intellect didn't know that there was a civil rights movement and that the rights, rights of human beings exceeds the property rights in all instances and are paramount. Uh, that's why the thing like here, the rights of the, the owner or the operator, such as to deny service to someone that they choose, or, or say, you can't, we will not serve this people, this ethnic group, or this racial makeup, that's the heritage of Milton Friedman. Bullshit. If you want to celebrate that, that's great. The other thing, amazingly enough, anti-regulation uh, the theme is over and over again. He hates the Code of Federal Regulations. Well, if you like poisonous air, if you like water that if you drink it, kills you instantaneously, then, you, you know, there? I guess we can be against regulation here and we can let the free market. I was trying to think of one instance where the free market on their own has ever improved the quality of the environment anywhere on earth. I really can't think of one. Maybe there is one. I don't know. And last of all, oh by the way, October 24th is United Nations Day, so let's all celebrate uh, the holiday. And last of all, the word this gentleman is so soundly wrong. This is entirely incorrect. This country does have a national purpose. He says there's no national purpose. What a vacant, vacant person. We have a national purpose. It's to improve the quality of life yes, it is. of every person in it. Not the property owners, not the CEOs, not the rich, the people that make less than minimum wage. We don't come up with arguments to deny people a standard of living that they should be entitled to for performing work and come up with lame, lame, silly, silly, silly arguments to deny them so that we can keep the wealth for ourselves. What about the welfare? There is a national purpose and you're facing it. And the Libertarian Party better wake up. And the only because way to do that is with a booming economy. And among the young people, and it's going to be around here for generations to come, is that the people have had it with this bankrupt capitalist system and its exploitation and its, its and rewards for the 1%. That's ridiculous. If you don't think that should be eliminated, I don't know what economic, what economic book are you reading? You don't know about the stratification of our yes, society and you want more of it? No. Why? What? So it could benefit, so capitalism could benefit It's even called the antitrust law. No, that's it. It's ridiculous. Thank you very much. And you're dead wrong. You're dead wrong, Shirley Pena. Adam Smith. Adam Smith also advocated for the taxing of the government good and the welfare of the people. But you're dead wrong, Charlie. Speak into the mic. Would you like the mic? No. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, just kidding. Um, I want to thank the speaker. Uh, I actually do not have a rebuttal. It's just uh, it, it's a complicated topic for me, and it's made me uh, think about reading the book that you recommend. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, the uh, the topic of uh, HIV has been uh, brought up twice. So uh, in uh, the memory of a good friend of mine who died from AIDS, um, I feel uh, morally obligated to give a. Uh, uh, different opinion, and uh, I really don't like reading stuff, but uh, this is so well written that um, I think I'm just going to fall back on Wikipedia. The best place to start for anybody who's interested in this conspiracy theory, I think, is uh, Wikipedia on uh, HIV, AIDS, denialism. Uh, and I'm just going to read two paragraphs here. A HIV, AIDS, denialism is a belief is the belief contradicted by conclusive evidence that human immunodeficiency virus does not cause acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Some of its proponents reject the existence of HIV, while others accept that HIV exists but argue, but argue that it is a harmless passenger virus and not the cause of AIDS. 
insofar as they acknowledge AIDS is a real disease, they attribute it to some other combination of sexual behavior, recreation of drugs, malnutrition, poor sanitation, hemophilia, or the effects of drugs used to treat HIV. The scientific consensus is that evidence showing HIV to be the cause of AIDS is conclusive, and that HIV AIDS denialist claims are pseudoscienced based on conspiracy theories, faulty reasoning, cherry picking, and misrepresentation of mainly outdated scientific data. With the rejection of these arguments by the scientific community, HIV AIDS denialist material is now targeted at less scientific, scientifically sophisticated audiences and spread mainly through the internet. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Justin, for the presentation. Uh, a lot to respond to here. Uh, the truth being in sociology, one of the truths of sociology is that much of the time human beings associate with each other spontaneously without direct overhead coercion, and that all daily life processes all over the world, from the workplace to the family to whatever we might constitute as free time or spiritual life, has to be done to some extent by a routine that the people in it know how to do without them being directly whipped to do so by their masters. This is an argument that both Friedman and another one of the uh, heroes of the uh, libertarian intellectual movement, Friedrich Hayek, wrote about a great deal. Uh, someone had asked about Ron Paul and Rand Paul. In the family tree of these ideas, they tended to follow more a different Austrian economist and his American students which is why he usually, the Pauls usually quote Ludwig von Mises uh -huh. and Murray Rothbard rather than Hayek and Friedman. Uh -huh. That's just a sort of footnote on uh, the political history. In terms of Trump being the fulfillment of this, I find that ludicrous to an extent because he's such a revolt against international free trade and he believes in enormous amounts of spending while cutting taxes, I will grant you, but making deficits and accumulated debt soar and he selectively promises welfare state benefits to you know, elderly whites who vote for him and that sort of thing, rather than some sort of, ooh, if we could just reimagine society alongst voluntary exchange lines. Trump doesn't have any of that. And in fact, the anti-globalization has now become such a fun thing for that sort of talk show right wing to quote on Fox that you would think they had been the ones leading the protests in Seattle 20 years ago. <laughs> and instead of the Ralph Nader version of the anti-globalization movement, it's the Pat Buchanan version of anti-globalization rhetoric that has come from less than 1% of the vote in 2000 to about, what, 46% of the vote when Donald Trump won. Now, I assume some of that is more traditional Republican voters sort of hitting the snooze button. Uh, rather than saying, you're right, we never should have traded with any other country like Canada. Uh, but you'll never know. Okay. Canada's going to have an election on Monday. We'll see how that goes. It might not go very well for the sitting Liberal Party. And that is not because I'm excited to see Andrew Scheer come into power. He is a Canadian turn towards increasing amounts of social conservatism, which they were supposed to be cured of. Uh, Another thing Canada is big on, despite sometimes being admired by the United States, Canada and Norway both make a great deal of their money to pay for their social network of welfare programs from oil extraction, uh, because they have small populations but a lot of mineral wealth. Um, picking a different example from Scandinavia, I know we've quoted this occasionally before, uh, the Free to Choose Network, one of their uh, spokesmen now is Johan Norbert, a Swedish-born uh, author who talks about how one of the things in Sweden they have a fully voucherized education system and I find it often amusing uh, having married into a family with close ties to the Chicago Teachers Union that they want the sorts of things they have in Sweden except they want it through an old-fashioned 20th century centrally directed public school system rather than a fully voucherized Swedish system Swedish style system where okay well maybe a social bargain would be that each student would get more spending, but they would get to take it wherever. And someone brought up church and state. That's the model in a lot of Western social democracies, the Catholic schools, the Protest you know, Protestant schools, to what extent there are. Like in Ontario, you can, on the taxpayer's dime, go to English language or French language Catholic school. Th this is how it is run. Who's that, Norberg? Uh, Norberg? Who's Norberg? Johan Norberg is a correspondent for the Free to Choose Network. 
well, I had too many notes and not enough time, so I apologize for wearing out my uh, welcome here. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. That's fine. All right. Speaker gets the last word. The last word. I remind you all once again, right as soon as the speaker's finished, could you all please begin to move to the back so the bus boy and Heather can clean this place? Thank you. We're running a little late tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, no. All right. Thanks, guys, for having me again. I had a good time. Uh, we're going to use Nobel Prize as like a uh, as a credential uh, in saying AIDS is a fake academic, uh, fake, uh, fake epidemic. And uh, I'm going to use that to say that Milton Friedman's ideas are awesome. So um, I'm not sure what the what capitalism freedom has to do with the Kennedy assassination. I must have missed what he meant by that. I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, and we have tons of regulations, tons of them. Uh, this idea that we don't have regulations or that we live in a laissez-faire economic system is demonstrably false. Um, AIDS is fake. 9-11 is fake. I'm surprised Andy doesn't think global warming is fake. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see how some conspiracy theorists uh, have like cafeteria uh, beliefs or whatever. Um, <clears throat> that's interesting to see from a sociological perspective. Um, Milton Friedman had no hand in Pinochet's tyranny. Uh, you can say it does, but it doesn't. Um, you know, Pino Milton Friedman didn't plan the coup. He didn't uh, execute any communists. He didn't throw people out of helicopters. Uh, Milton Friedman doesn't endorse that sort of thing, so I don't know why people continue to say that he did. Uh, to say that Milton Friedman had no um, interest in the civil rights movement, Charlie's bullshitting himself. Uh, if he claims he's read the book, he must have missed the chapter on capitalism discrimination. Uh, Charlie does not read books, he just creates straw men, and uh, so he just much rather would do that than, than to read the books. Um, I don't think that, I don't think Milton Friedman advocated pollution, despite what some of you guys said. If you, if you guys would have read the book, as you claim, you had would have noticed he talk about pollution as being a negative neighborhood effect. Um, no natural purpose. Uh, I don't know when Milton Friedman said that. Again, Charlie likes to create these straw men. Um, yeah, uh, but thanks guys. I had a good time and I, I can't wait to come again and speak. Thank you. Devil us out, Andy. Devil us out. Speaker, can I have your attention, please? Uh, can we take a survey? How many people here would like to see a debate between Justin and me on what's real and what isn't? The subject. Would anybody like to see a debate on those subjects that I say are real and are blacked out? Would you guys like to see a debate between us? Two? I think it'd be the best evidence that he's not bringing the evidence on the other side. Okay. Yeah, evidence based. Well then, uh, let's uh, let's have Charlie schedule it sometime. All right. Okay. All right. Devil us out, Andy. For tonight. Thank you. All right.